afternoon and welcome to the Clinton School of Public Service. I'm Dr. Ellen Fitzpatrick. I'm the Director of International Programs. And today we have a special treat. Uh, we're hearing from four of our students who have just returned in the last uh, uh, month or so from their field work abroad. Each year, students are asked to design and conduct a graduate level field project outside the United States. For many students, this is their first time abroad. They have gained field experience working in a new environment and adjusted to different cultural norms. They undergo intense preparation before they leave the Clinton School with regards to social science field techniques, culture, politics, and yes, health. Perhaps most of them have learned how to be flexible, adapt to different rules of the game, and to do it with grace. Most have grown in ways that will serve them well, both personally and in their careers. So today I'd like to introduce you to Brandon Matthews, Tatiana Riddle, Tracy Johnson, and Julian Kelly. They're going to talk a little bit, I've asked them to talk for two or three minutes to describe their international experience, and then I have some specific questions to ask them. So if you could uh, start, Julian, and talk about your, your international project in just a few minutes. No problem. Uh, hello, uh, and thank you. Uh, first and foremost, I just want to thank you all for coming out today. Um, as Dr. Fitzpatrick said, my name is Julian Kelly. I am a second year student here, and I traveled to Nairobi, Kenya for the summer. I worked with an organization called the Legal Researchers Foundation Trust, and what we did is that we wanted to raise civic awareness among the citizens of Kenya to try to help them to become more politically involved. And so we did some research on the rights that they have as political uh, participants, and we developed a handbook to inform them of those rights and also to provide them with methods that they could use to actually become more involved within their government and political processes. Um, as Dr. Fitzpatrick mentioned as well, this, that was my first time going, uh, uh, traveling internationally. It was a wonderful experience. I look forward to sharing that more in depth with you as the uh, program goes on today. Hi, I'm Tracy Johnson, and I went to Dhaka, Bangladesh this summer with Habitat for Humanity. My project was originally to develop an advocacy program in, as it was the progress, progress project went on, it became more about providing recommendations for the organization. Advocacy was a new step at this organization for Habitat. There's different parts of the world are doing advocacy, but in Bangladesh it was their first step at it. So my project really went looking over what other Habitat organizations are doing around the world in terms of advocacy, and then providing specific recommendations for Habitat Bangladesh. Hello, my name is Tatiana Riddle. I was in uh, Banda Aceh, Indonesia, which is on the island of Sumatra in Indonesia, the northernmost province. Um, I worked with a group called the Aceh Climate Change Initiative, and they are trying to, they're a fairly new organization, and they are trying to engage legislators on environmental conservation uh, issues in Banda Aceh. So what I did was I provided some basic kind of program support for them. I developed an English language brochure, a lessons learned document, and a few other little deliverables. So. And my name is Brandon Matthews. Um, I had the opportunity to travel to Kentha, Vietnam, which is about two to three hours southwest of Ho Chi Minh City. And so I worked with um, Kentha University. It's their largest university there in the Mekong Delta, and also with the organization Peace Work on a project that had me working with um, community members assessing their perceptions of health in the region, um, specifically um, Kwa An, it's the uh, hamlet I worked in, and then also working with healthcare professionals at the health clinic, the district hospital, and the district health center, looking at how they uh, provide services and the system they use to evaluate that. So um, it was a really great experience. Thank you. Uh, Tatiana, what was your biggest fear before you left the United States? Um, probably my biggest fear that I had, or it was more of an apprehension. Um, I had never traveled to Asia or Africa before, so this is my first time to Asia, um, and I think I was just a bit nervous about knowing that I wouldn't know the language. Um, it was a completely different atmosphere there. Um, 
Banda Aceh is, or Aceh province is the most conservative um, Muslim province in Indonesia, so I uh, wore a headscarf, and so it was just being in a totally different environment I think I was a bit nervous about, but it, it, it was really nice. Okay, thank you. Julian, what do you, what do you think was, what was your biggest fear before you left? I think I know, but go ahead and share. <laughs> Uh, honestly, my biggest fear uh, was just being away from my family, uh, my girlfriend, just the, the loved ones that I have for such a long time. Again, that was the first time that I'd ever been outside of the country, and to be away from those type of relationships for 11 weeks, uh, I just knew it was going to be a difficult experience. Um, but say within uh, about the first three weeks, I really adjusted to the opportunity that I was in with Nairobi, and so I was able to really overcome that original fear that I had before leaving for Kenya. And we kept a good eye on Julian, because being in Nairobi after the violence that had occurred several months ahead of time, we, were, we wanted to make sure that uh, he was safe and felt safe. So we're glad you were. Oh, she did a very good job, by the way. Just wanted to go there. <laughs> OK. Um, what, uh, Brandon, what was your most significant challenge, either personally or professionally? And how were you pressed mentally and emotionally by this experience? So I think the biggest challenge for me was trying to understand the Vietnamese language. Um, I have no language skills. I walked away with a few. Um, but in a professional setting, I had to work with um, the community members, interviewing households um, and health staff, and there was that barrier. So we weren't able to communicate directly. So having to rely on um, the staff that I was working with to translate everything um, sometimes proved to be very difficult. Um, access to information, um, all the documents were in Vietnamese. So again, I had to rely on the staff to translate those. And really, um, they did a tremendous job making sure that I could um, access those materials related to the health system there and, and how things work. But communication was probably the, the most challenging thing. And at times, it frustrated me, um, especially in my personal life, just for simple things like getting around the city that I was in, um, ordering food, and trying to get the accent right. For those you who don't know, there are five different accents in the Vietnamese language. Um, it makes it extremely difficult to order food, um, and especially for somebody who can't understand or hear the difference in that, like the difference in ga or ga, which is fish or tomato. And often or not, I would end up ordering soup with tomatoes when I really wanted soup with fish. So that proved to be quite difficult at times. And knowing the language is really important because there are many kinds of meats in that area of Vietnam. So I know just recently I thought I was eating chicken and it was rice-fed rat. Yeah. Um, so you just want to have a sense of what it is you're saying and <laughs> eating. Okay, um, Tracy, would you answer that same question? What was your most significant challenge, personally or professionally? My most significant challenge was probably with my project scope. In going into it, we knew it was going to be a very large project, but trying to figure out advocacy it needs to be based on the community needs and what they want. And I'm not from Bangladesh. As Brandon said, he, I don't speak the language either. Um, and I still don't know any of the language. But Habitat was really great about helping me with that, but still trying to read government policies in a country that the government is not super clear on what their policies are. They don't usually even have policies on a lot of the issues you're trying to address. So trying to find that direction that I could go while I was there in 10 weeks, um, really what I ended up doing was just giving recommendations and trying to give a direction and talking a lot with my supervisor about what they could do once I wasn't there and once they had more resources because I couldn't do it all, unfortunately. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Now I want to ask you all, um, what are you the most proud of? What was your greatest accomplishment, either personally or professionally? Julian, you want to start us out? Uh, I want to say my greatest personal accomplishment. Um, honestly, with the project itself, I want to say, particularly because over the course of my entire project, I feel like there was a time where the coworkers that I, were, I was with and that I started off the project with, because we were working with organizations where they have different focuses or they have different goals and different responsibilities that we as students don't have. It's not, we're not necessarily, not necessarily interns, but at the same time, we're not actually in the same 
uh, group or the same situation that the actual workers are. And so I say that because after a certain time, their focus really shifted to what they had already been doing since, they, since I've been there. They were focusing on their job responsibilities versus really helping me, I guess, as much on the project that I was working on. And so to a certain point, it felt as if I was kind of on my own working on the project. And I feel like to be able to have really overcome that because things definitely got difficult. You know, there were a lot of times where I felt as if I didn't have anyone that I could go to to ask certain questions or to see what sources of uh, research could I use. But I was able to overcome those and I was very thankful for that. Um, but looking back on that, it was a very, uh, it was an experience that I really learned from. Uh, just learning how to work on my own, how to overcome different challenges that I know I only experienced during my time there, but that I may experience future in my, uh, as I go, go on in my career. Thank you. I'm going to take my, what I'm most proud about personally, I'm really proud that I went to Bangladesh. Um, before I went, everyone would say, do you know how busy of a city Dhaka is? It's a, me it's a mega city and it's one of the busiest cities, one of the most populated cities in the world. And so going there and not knowing what that really meant, I mean, I'm from Indiana, that, that was, <laughs> I've never been, I've been abroad, but never to a city like Dhaka. So I'm proud that I went there and that I was able to see a lot of the country with both Habitat and other organizations while I was there and really introduce them to the Clinton School and who we are and our ideas, but also help to just learn about them as a country, because I never imagined going there before. So did you feel adequately stretched? Yes, but I felt <laughs> adequately supported as well. Oh, Habitat good. and the Clinton School are both really great about preparing me for what we could prepare for, but also being like, you gotta be ready for what you're not gonna be able to prepare for, and it was fine. <laughs> okay, thanks. Tatiana? Yeah, I think in a similar way to Tracy and Julian, um, I'm most proud of the fact that I allowed myself to have a positive experience. Um, IPSB is a lot of what you make of it, um, and I, there were many things that took me out of my comfort zone, <laughs> uh, such as wearing a headscarf and eating strange things, and, and, um, but I allowed myself to have a positive experience and really learn some lessons in flexibility and adaptability. Brandon? So I don't like crossing large bodies of water. <laughs> that was probably the personal achievement. No. But uh, professionally, um, there's one interaction I had that really stood out and I was, um, we were finishing up some late morning uh, interviews and we came to one of the last houses. Um, I thought it was a house, um, turns out it was a hut, but the woman had invited us in. Um, she was on the list of people we were to survey. Um, asking questions about, you know, the perceptions of the health clinic in the area and, um, you know, her health, what she does to take care of her health, things like that. And um, the woman just couldn't believe that some outsider, let alone their own community, was listening to her. I mean, her story, she was, uh, um, she had been divorced at a younger age um, by her husband. She was operating like a snow cone shack um, for the children and just providing like candies and things like that. And she just couldn't uh, believe that we cared about her health or we wanted to do something to make life different for her. So for me, um, that still stands out. I mean, her, just her generosity and acceptance of us, but then just the fact that we were there doing something for her. So, I mean, I really got a lot out of my experience as far as like personal wealth and just the, the opportunity to help somebody else in a situation I never thought I could. So that's probably the greatest accomplishment that I had. Thank you. And now we have class 10 beginning to think about their international projects and talking with me and James Mitchell about where in the world they'd like to go and what kind of work they'd like to do. So what advice would you give to class 10 as they begin to think about their projects? Brandon, you want to start us? So. For me, the destination was really important. Um, this is potentially a once in a lifetime opportunity for me to go somewhere I'd never been, to go outside of my comfort zone. And um, I chose Vietnam and it was a wonderful experience. So I think when you're choosing where you wanna go with this opportunity, um, think about where you wanna go and know that the skills and the activities that you wanna do, you're gonna find those in many different places. So I think finding the environment you really want to challenge yourself, um, the environment you want to learn more about, the community, the culture, um, is something that should 
drive a lot of your decision making. It did for me, and um, I have no regrets about it. I would say do as much research as you can before you leave uh, on the culture of the, the area that you're going to be in. Um, I was in Indonesia, which has the highest Muslim population in the world during the month of Ramadan, and it was a fascinating cultural experience, but in terms of work, it really slowed down. Um, we had a whole week at the end of Ramadan after it ended where nobody worked. <laughs> so um, I, I think my advice to class 10 would just be to, to know what is going to be happening when you're there and to know different cultural nuances. I agree with both of my classmates, but I would also, this goes with Brandon, but a little bit opposite of Brandon. Think of what you want to learn the most. I, I knew I didn't, I wanted to go somewhere new, but I didn't really, the specific country wasn't important to me. It was more about what I was going to be doing. I wanted, I knew I wanted to work on advocacy and finding that project and being able to develop that, although it was a challenge, it really was a great experience and has helped me now and my capstone and my other goals. So. Really think about if it's about the place or it's about the project, try to figure out which one it is about and really focus on that and go all in as much as you can. Um, I really want to touch on an idea that Tatiana mentioned earlier, just truly grasping the idea and the concept that, concept that you're going to make this experience as you make it. Um, there are going to be situations that, you, that may occur that you didn't expect moving forward. You may have really had a lot of conversations with your project supervisor and you, you kind of sort of build these expectations, but once you get there, something may happen in your living experience or living situation, something may happen with a certain person that you're working with. So just understand and grasp the concept that this is going to be, a, a lot of this is going to be in your hands. A lot of the control that you will have over the project will be on you. And so do the absolute best in your preparation and really uh, evolving and really expanding your expectation level. Um, and just, just recognizing that this is a once in a lifetime experience, it's gonna be very important, but that's a lot is gonna be in your own shoulders. And just to really be aware of that and uh, just take, and just really grasp that. I think that that's a, a really good uh, ending uh, thought that you leave students with. And that is that we spend a lot of time, well, we'll spend a lot of time next semester preparing uh, for your project, researching the country you're going to, really thinking deeply about the social science techniques that you need to accomplish your project. Um, but you can get to the country and then have things radically shift. So many students over the years have reported that what's really important in your training and in this experience is learning how to be flexible, learning how to adapt. It's challenging when um, you, you set up lots of meetings and nobody shows up. Or you say, let's meet at two and they show up at four. And so you have this opportunity to either get mad and irritated or to handle it with grace and really gain the respect and, um, and admiration of your colleagues. And as that, as you are able to do that, to, to yield with grace, uh, it, it bodes well for both the Clinton School and for you as, as American citizens, as a representative of the United States. So I really encourage you to keep that little nugget in the back of your head when you're frustrated uh, in your new environments. Are there any questions from the audience that you'd like to ask the, the students? My name is Darla Embry and I'm from Winrock International and I'm interested in tapping into resources. How did you, did you have a specific terms of reference or scope of work and go do partners to work on your projects or did they approach you? And what was the length of time you were all in country? Um, so I actually had the opportunity to work with a um, um, partner. Uh, Peacework was the uh, point of contact and I worked with Jesse Rice here. She helped me set up my project through the Clinton School. So um, a lot of the scoping uh, was already decided for me that I was going to um, the work. So working with the um, physicians, the health clinic, the district health center, and interviewing households and community members, that was all kind of decided as far as deciding how many and, and you know where to start and which hamlets to go to, all of that we still had to work out. But 
um, I pretty much um, had a good idea what the project was towards the end of my first semester, a little after now, I'd say mid-November, so I pretty much decided I wanted to go to Vietnam, and the opportunity came that there was a project there, and it was related to um, a topic that I was interested in, so I took that uh, opportunity. I was in the country for 10 weeks, um, which was a little shorter than some of my colleagues, um, had, getting married before, or soon, soon come back, so had to get back soon for that. But if I could have stayed longer, um, I would have definitely. Um. Tatiana, you had a little different experience, yeah? Um, yeah, my project was arranged um, by the Clinton School, but mostly with a, there's, I had the benefit of having a class two Clinton School alum, an Indonesian young woman in country. So she helped me a lot with setting up my project. Um, and then I ended up working with the organization. And Banda Aceh is not very big, so <laughs> it wasn't very hard to find. Um, but it was a Clinton School arranged project. And then in the second semester, we developed work plans. So. Um, we we have every week laid out before we go. It's bound to change, but we do make that plan before. Anybody else comments? No? Okay. I also went through a partner project with the school. This was Habitat's first time having someone in Bangladesh, and my supervisor was hired the week before me, before I arrived in Bangladesh. That's because advocacy is a new project for Habitat. So. That was a challenge, but so we didn't really talk that much in advance. I prepared as much as I could, um, but once we got there, we really had to figure out what we were going to do. And he had he had worked for Habitat before and had a lot of connections in the nonprofit community, so it was not a problem. And I was in country for right about 11 weeks. Um, so in working with the legal with the LRF, um, there have been two. Uh, prior students who'd worked with them from the Clinton School. I was able to talk with one of them, just someone briefly, just to kind of get a good feel for what I'd be doing, or excuse me, who, who, would, I, who would I be working with uh, once I got to LRF. But a lot of the project planning was set up with the project supervisor who was the program director of LRF, and I also did some com communication with the CEO. Um, and so uh, primarily as the t project went on and uh, developed, it was the CEO who really became my primary point of contact. Um, but uh, uh, as Tatiana and Tracy said, a lot of things were already set up. Um, um, again, during the second semester, we go through a work plan, we go through, and actually go through which uh, we'll be doing certain uh, projects or certain work uh, plans throughout the entire uh, project or whatnot. So it's kind of set up accordingly once we actually get there, but again, things definitely can change. Fascinating experience, I have no doubt. Can you give me just a brief summary of what you think the impact of your project, the actual thing you were doing, or the product of that project was? So the work that I did was um, a lot of the foundational work for this new role um, village model that they've designed for the Mekong Delta increase, to increase development. Um, there's 19 different um, initiatives like health, education, um, economic, there's all kinds of fields. But mine was specifically related to health. And so what didn't exist at the time was kind of a basis of what people thought of the health care in the area. Um, specifically Huang, it was one of the poorest um, communes in the Mekong Delta. And so they tend to fall behind on the standards. Um, for example, 70% of um, residents um, are supposed to have some form of health insurance. Uh, that's been met by the Mekong Delta on an average. But when you look at um, Huaeng, only 50, about 52% of the population have access to health insurance, whether it's provided by the government or through their job or some other form. Um, and so then there's also um, the method they use to evaluate the services at the um, local level, so in the commune, the health clinic, at the district level, and then um, eventually at the provincial level. And so that system was kind of um, unregulated, or there were systems and guidelines put in place, but they weren't always kept. Uh, the records I found were outdated and semi-regular, so it was difficult to see like a standardized improvement or uh, decrease in the amount of quality work. So 
a lot of what I did was the foundation for somebody else to move in and start tackling some of those challenges, like keeping up with the records or noticing um, what's wrong with the facilities. Is there something they can add, some kind of service, or the way they're accessing uh, the community and getting information out? I think the biggest impact of my project was probably um, bettering their communication and outreach because they only started November 2013 and I was working, it's a fairly small organization, uh, my supervisor and then uh, three or four young people working there. Um, the young people working there spoke no English uh, and my supervisor was fairly proficient but um, not completely fluent. So. And in their work, they wanted to get other partners that were outside of Indonesia. So, like, we had meetings with the Australia Zoo, with the European Union, um, and that by having communication materials that were in English that I helped to develop, it was easier to communicate with other potential partners. I would say that I pr primarily gave them a good recommendation and outline or direction to go into. When we started, I mean, Bangladesh has so many ways that you could advocate. There's so many issues throughout the country, and there's so many people that you could do advocacy forever. And so I think trying to calm them down and say, let's really focus on what we can do as an organization, what you can do strategically and like feasibility-wise. And so and giving them that support, because they, they had so many ideas and really just saying, slow down. Let's make sure we know how, what the numbers are. I mean, you can't find a good population on DACA because there's so many people moving around, so just trying to find statistics and those things before we really start to go to the government and say, we want help, we need to know the basic stuff first. So I was really trying to bring them back a little bit and give them a direction to go into. I want to say uh, the primary uh, value of the project was really somewhat establishing networks uh, among different organizations that are within Nairobi in particular. We were able to meet with some of the human rights organizations. We were able to meet with some of the government and legal leaders within the Nairobi community. Um, I'm not exactly sure if LRF had never met with some of those uh, organizations or individuals, but being able to really involve them in the research and in the development of the project, I think not only benefited LRF, but also the organizations that we worked with as well. Uh, they were very very interested in the future of the project. Just they were really wanted to know how things went be, uh, throughout the entire project and beyond. And so I, I definitely think some of the networks that could have been established and the uh, interactions that we had with those uh, different organizations, I think, were definitely beneficial to the project and to LRF uh, in, uh, overall. Hello, I'm Becky, class 10. So we're thinking about all this. I just have a logistical kind of question, logistics question about computer and internet access and that kind of thing because a lot of you were in sort of remote places and along with doing the project, you have to have you know, something written up and a planning paper and then something at the end and I'm wondering how that worked for you and if you could talk about if you did have some obstacles and getting it all done on the deadline. And So working in Nairobi, which is a major city in Kenya, you know, fairly urban, I was I was blessed with the opportunity to have direct internet access, particularly where I work. Now going back to the living situation, I think that was just more of a personal choice by the host. You know, she she didn't have internet uh, access, so you know, going home, I wasn't able to do a lot of work once I got there. But uh, I, I never had, um, unlike certain certain students, you know, who unfortunately didn't have it, I was very blessed with the opportunity to actually have it at the workspace that I was uh, working in. I'm a bad example. I also had wonderful internet access. Um, I lived right beside the organization. I was even able to connect to it when I was at my apartment. Um, the internet stayed on even when the power was out. So, I mean, you didn't have air conditioning, but you'd have internet. I did have issues with internet when I traveled with them for a week. I didn't have any internet access. And, um, that was a challenge that I didn't prepare properly for. I probably should have emailed some people saying I'm not going to be in touch, or I should have asked that question. Um, so I would prepare to do that. But I had internet the whole time other than that. 
My office was on the campus of a university in Bandache, so we had um, great internet access at, in our office. Um, on the side of my where I was living, I lived with a, a retired professor, and he did not have internet access. So the Indonesians are fairly technologically connected, so they have all kinds of different devices. So I had used a modem, an external modem, when I was home, but it was it was fine. <laughs> There's internet everywhere in Vietnam. Um, but part of that is, so in the village I worked in, not so much. There were about 20,000 people spread out over uh, like over 100 square miles. It was, it was a large piece of land. Um, but I lived in a city with one and a half million people. Uh, so every other street corner, there was a cafe with internet Wi-Fi. Um, the hotel I stayed in was supposed to have Wi-Fi and didn't for like the first six weeks, there were problems. So I actually had to go to the College of Rural Development is where I did most of my work in the village and they had um, internet access there. Otherwise, accessing it traveling uh, wasn't so much when I was out in the field. So I was pretty limited on what I could do unless it was late in the evening and I was back home or it was early in the morning and I was still in the office. But for the most part, communication was pretty easy since I was with the staff I was with constantly commuting back home, 12-hour um, difference in the time zone made that difference. So just being aware that you might stay up till 10, 11 o'clock at night to send that email update um, to the people back home that you're um, also working with. We had a group of uh, our three, three students, four students that were in Uganda, in the northern part of Uganda. And this was a school um, that is, uh, receives a large uh, donation from Forrest Whitaker, the movie actor, Last King of Scotland. And so while I was visiting the students there, and the students were there, um, as the time that he was coming to campus approached, internet access just increased. And then he came with some folks from Ericsson, uh, who wanted to use um, their donations to the school as a PR campaign. Internet access was amazing. You know, you could see mice scurrying around in front of you, but you had great internet access. Um, and then weeks after Forrest Whitaker left, you could see the internet capabilities diminish. Uh, in many places, especially when you're off the grid, um, you can get internet access that's solar powered. Um, so it depends on whether it's the rainy season or the dry season, what kind of internet access you get. But uh, it's a far cry from writing aerograms home once a week. You prob most of you probably don't even know what those are. <laughs> the sheet of paper that you write on and then fold and mail, so you get cheap, cheap s stamps. Other questions, concerns, interests? I'm Carol Gaddis with the University of Arkansas Honors College in Fayetteville. And I'm curious that as students, there must be some kind of assessment that goes on after you get back that assesses how well you've done, what kind of grades you're going to get if you're graded. What kind of assessment is there and what are your deliverables? So, Sometimes projects don't always work out. You don't always get to the end goal that you set up months in advance. And so we're not graded, per se, on whether or not you met that goal or you failed um, to deliver that, but it's the work that you've done through it. Um, there's a series of things. We have um, updates that we have to send. There are um, two main papers during the extent. There's a midterm report and an end-of-term report that you do that describes the work you've done. Um, you've, we've got a work log that we submit that shows, the, you know, detailed what we've done day to day, the activities, who was involved. And so um, there's a pretty constant monitoring of what we're doing, but we have the leeway to kind of decide what our deliverables are going to be. Um, for me, it turned out to be a, like an academic paper and then a, a booklet of the key findings, and important information we thought that if this was the only thing that we could deliver to somebody, um, like the hospitals and the local health clinic, what would it be? And so we put that together and it was about a 12-pager of just some of the key findings we had. So, but I'd, I'd venture to say that everybody here had a different type of deliverable, so. 
<laughs> no, I had a, yeah, I, my deliverables were fairly, I had about four or five, but they were fairly small, so I did them over the course of the, the time that I was there, and, and I achieved most of the things, or I think all of the things that I did, um, but we do write when we come back, um, I think about a month after we come back in September, we um, have to write a, a paper that includes a fair bit of reflection on, on our experience, both professionally and personally, so. Any other? Yeah, my deliverable was not an academic paper. It was multiple, small, so it was a timeline was one. It was different info sheets, so focusing on water in Bangladesh or disaster relief, things that they could use in the future. They also have a lot, Habitat has a lot of volunteer events, so giving them ways, examples of tweets or finding ways that Habitat already shares this and just using, sharing that information with Bangladesh is my main deliverable. Um, and my main deliverable was a handbook that tried to educate the citizens of Nairobi and Kenya on their civ civic awareness, trying to raise their civic awareness and engaging them on what their political rights were to become more involved, to really uh, do a better job of exercising their sovereign right as citizens to make decisions with the government. Um, what that uh, handbook was, it was a six-part book that really went over the history of those rights, that discussed what those rights are currently, and also different methods and the difficulties that they may face in order, and when they, whenever they may practice or if they choose to practice those rights. And if I could just add, these deliverables do vary tremendously and sometimes they're unexpected. We had uh, one student who went to South Africa to work at um, a school, a school that was connected, who served um, migrant populations. And she went there thinking she was going to develop a curriculum that would help them make the transition from, oh, about sixth grade into to a work life. And when she got there, the uh, school had lost its funding and it was closing. And so she, had, she basically took the task of helping to close that school. So it was really a, um, uh, she didn't know this was gonna happen until about four weeks into her project. So she was really deeply committed to the, to the mission of the school and to the work that they were doing and to the children. And then to have to take this on of helping that school close in a way that other partners would take up parts of their work. I thought it was just unexpected, but really uh, uh, an opportunity that um, she handled very well. Uh, another student, uh, one of their deliverables was creating a hand washing system that would be sustainable. Uh, other students uh, were very involved in uh, empowering young women to feel comfortable asking for the things they needed to keep themselves safe. Um, so some things were very concrete, some of the deliverables were very concrete, some were academic, and some were in many ways advocacy. So there was a real difference across uh, uh, the whole class, a, really a, a richness of experiences, different kinds of experiences. Any other questions? Okay. Yes. I have like five, but I'm gonna try and prioritize just one. Um, <laughs> um, uh, I'm Shannon, um, and so I was wondering, it sounded like in sort of the development of your projects and your proposals, um, how much communication did you have or understanding did you have of like that community and its needs um, before determining what you were going to um, deliver as a project or an initiative? So a lot of the communication that I had in with the project itself dealt specifically with the organization. Um, there wasn't a lot of going out, uh, hosting focus groups or really gauging exactly how the community would respond to the project. I feel as if the organization sort of already taken the liberty of doing that, just really knowing, okay, so we've done, we've gotten information on this, we've gotten research on this. This is the deliverable, deliverable that you want, we want you to work on. And so I feel as if that was kind of already done in case. Now again, we did reach out to different organizations, different human rights groups, groups, different leaders, to kind of get a sense of how can we really uh, better the project itself, but a lot of that work, uh, really working with the community itself, and our, I feel like it had already been done uh, moving before I even arrived uh, at Nairobi. 
Habitat is engaged in, I think, eight different areas of Bangladesh, and so they have projects that are different program specific, but I was trying to get them to ask questions that they either hadn't asked before or in a different direction. So we were still trying to work on getting that information from them. We knew there were needs, we knew there were people that didn't have land ownership or that was disaster relief, those kind of issues. And so, but trying to figure out how the community goes about that and what other organizations are already there is something that Habitat's working on. And that was one of the recommendations to build a coalition and really talk to the organizations that are already there. Because there's a lot of aid already happening there and Habitat's not the biggest organization in Bangladesh by far. So trying to figure out how they can work was my main project. My situation was very similar to Julian's. Um, my organization, since it was so new, what it really needed was to build its organizational capacity. So in terms of their target audience, our target audiences are legislators, and they went um, before I, in March and April before I arrived and went around and talked to, to all of the political parties in Aceh. But a lot of my work, I, I attended some meetings with legislators, but most of them didn't speak English, so, um, but so a lot of my work was was just helping the organization build itself up. So the organization piece work that I talked about earlier, um, which is really kind of the connecting piece for the um, university that I work with, the College of Rural Development. Um, Jesse traveled there several times, you know, gathering information, meeting with. Um, the staff and then other people in the area that this project um, would involve. And so, um, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of that, the stuff prior to going was already um, pretty much well laid out for me. Um, I had the opportunity to kind of get in there and think that my project wasn't going to change. Um, it did a little bit. Um, about week five, I had a student from Hendricks, an undergraduate, that would come in and assist me with some of the work. and. Um, Five weeks in, we kind of found some missing pieces to the information of the project we set up. We came in with um, some preconceived notions, these thoughts about the community and what they were doing related to health, or maybe they didn't care, and really found out that it wasn't so much that they didn't care about their health, um, it was access and timing and things like that. And so that made us kind of reevaluate some of the questions we had asked and some of the work that we were doing. So towards the second, five weeks of my project, um, some of that shifted and we changed the focus a little bit. While we still looked at the infrastructure, we really started to look more at you know, the public perception and what the households um, were really thinking more or less um, about their health instead of just the health facilities that are being provided. This year we had, we had an experiment that I think worked very well. We had um, two students from Hendricks and one a student from the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville who joined our students. Uh, what, we, what our objective was was to provide an opportunity for undergraduates to be able to work abroad, to do substantial work abroad, but have it be a little less scary because they're with a graduate student um, and our, our students mentored these, these undergraduates. Um, and I think that it worked really well. Um, Brandon can talk about that, uh, but uh, from my experience visiting them in um, Uganda, they were really amazing and added a lot to our team. Uh, so I think we're going to continue on and, uh, and provide this opportunity for undergraduates, and it also provides an opportunity for our students to uh, share their knowledge, their uh, total confidence as they're in the field, um, and, and just to have another uh, colleague there to, to think about the challenges that they face in, in both their work and personal environment. Other questions or comments? Great. Oh, one more? I'm Jesse Rice. I represent PeaceWork and work very closely with the International Programs Office here. Um, in my experiences, well, you all have traveled to such, to cultures with such different um, personalities and values than, than our own culture. And whenever I am able to travel 
I, my own value system kind of opens up and I'm able to examine it and I learn a lot by comparing that, those values to those that I'm experiencing in, um, in my destination country. So I wonder if any of you had that opportunity and what you learned about yourself. So um, I had a really interesting experience. Uh, well, Ramadan is, was interesting during the month, but then at the end of Ramadan, um, it's a week-long, or actually a month-long celebration because it starts a new month. But um, during this one week, right after Ramadan ends, um, the custom is to bake a bunch of cookies and set them out on your coffee table and then open your house and have strangers just come in um, and we visited several other houses and so experiencing that because I kept thinking I would never allow a stranger in my house um, experiencing that really uh, kind of showed me how different the social fabric of the communities there are um, and how different that would be in the US. I also visited a country that was predominantly Muslim, but Habitat as an organization has a diversity of religions. And so on the work week was Sunday through Thursday there. And on Sundays, we would have somebody from the office always talk about normally a different value, so it was, um, you know, kindness, trust, also sometimes Ramadan, when Ramadan was going on. So that, just how it could work and so easily in the organization, but also in the country, there's a lot of diversity, and this was my first experience being in a country like this, and I felt, always felt very welcome, always felt very um, comfortable, and they, people were always open to asking me asking questions and explaining anything and everything. So it was really eye-opening and reassuring experience. Um, the most valuable experience that Kenya or that Nairobi specifically provided for me um, is that being there, uh, just walking on the streets or just looking at billboards or just sitting at home and just watching TV, and you see people who look just like you, and I mean everywhere. You, you don't see that you know, um, very often. You know, being a black student here in America, I don't see that. And so being able to experience that for the first time was a very a valuable, a very enriching experience for me, something that I was very thankful for, something that I really, uh, truly enjoyed. I would just say, um, going from um, Arkansas, it's in the south, and transplanting to Vietnam in the south, the southern hospitality is all over the place. Like, I don't, it doesn't matter where you are. If you're in the south somewhere, people are going to be love and warming and kind. Um, and it kind of goes to, you know, strangers opening up their homes. And when we did the interviews and sat down with households, I, I got tired of eating food and, you know, people offering gifts. I mean, it was great. Not that I was tired, just full. Um, but people were just welcoming of me, and surprisingly, first meeting them, um, they thought I was Vietnamese, which I thought was crazy until I couldn't speak Vietnamese, and then they were like, what's, what's wrong? Why, why aren't you talking to us? And so, <laughs> but, but people got a kick out of that. But I mean, overall, it was just tremendous. I mean, I also got to work in, uh, with families that were considered like well off in the area versus the poor. Um, and looking at the difference in the things they had and seeing that the lifestyle for some of them wasn't too different. It's just a matter of how consistently they can bring in an income um, that guarantees that, you know, the security that we have here. So maybe you're a poor household, um, and you've got dirt floors and a, a roof that's, you know, made out of limbs and your neighbor has, you know, tile flooring nice things in the house, um, but they're doing the same work. You know, they're both farming, whether it's agriculture or animals, and it's just to see that the, the difference is really, can they bring an in income consistently to meet their standard of living? And it's just really eye-opening to see that. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much for coming, for your thoughtful questions and comments, and thank you, panel, for sharing your, your experiences.